Hey folks, how's it going? Dr. Spin. Eclectic Guide Reviews and General Musical Meanderings. One of the big points of my channel is to try to hit people to music that maybe they hadn't heard somewhere before, or music that's particularly important, or maybe personally important to me. This album is all of those things and more. It's Kevin Gilbert's The Shaming of the True. And to understand the importance of The Shaming of the True, you really have to kind of understand who Kevin Gilbert is, where he's coming from, because this album is sort of a, a synopsis of a lot of experiences that he had. It's almost autobiographical in some ways. And as such, it's actually a pretty important document of the 90s, especially from the perspective of, of a music insider in the industry. Everybody's gonna love me. Everybody's gonna care. Everyone will know my name. I've been listening to Dylan. I've been listening to the dead. I've been listening to the music that plays inside my head. I've been listening to the Beatles. I've been listening to the Who. And they don't know it yet, but they're gonna listen to me too. And Kelvin Gilbert's one of those musicians where if you know, you know. Um, because he's a huge talent who was in a, an unfortunately kind of destined to kind of haunt the, uh, the edges of liner notes in the late 80s and, and early 90s. He was an L.A.-based musician and an impressive multi-instrumentalist who was very open with his talents and was very uh, open to collaborating and sharing with people. And so, as such, he was part of lots of projects in the late 80s and early 90s that many people probably hadn't heard of. He was um, in a progressive rock band called Giraffe. He was also involved in another project called Caviar. Most visibly, he was uh, involved in a project called Toy Matinee. And his style was kind of like this too pop to be progressive, too progressive to be pop songwriting style, very niche, and probably more nuanced than the average listener would, would go for. And he was a very sought after collaborator in the early 90s and got involved in this group called the Tuesday Evening Music Club. And this is a group of people that met every week, group of musicians um, that would get together and write songs to each other, bounce ideas off of each other. And one of the members of this group was Sheryl Crow, who would go on to name an album after this Tuesday Evening Music Club that had the song All I Wanna Do. On that song, Kevin Gilbert is credited as a, as a piano player, but his contribution to the song, if rumors are to be believed, were way much more than that. And once you kind of know something about Kevin Gilbert's style, you can kind of see his, his hand in that song. And this is sort of the story of his, his musical career. He would continually get involved with stuff and not get credit for it. And it sent him into some, some pretty dark places, I think, emotionally. Shame in the True was Kevin Gilbert's rock opera, and it was released posthumously after his death in the year 2000. It was incomplete at the time of his passing, and so it came upon his colleagues, specifically Nick DiVirgilio um, of Spocksbeard fame, to find all these bits and pieces of, of this rock opera and kind of piece it together. And if you hear Nick DiVirgilio tell the tale, uh, it was very not an easy task to do because like any genius, like any prodigy, um, his recordings that he had prepared for this were pretty pretty well developed there's lots of them out there but they were left in unmarked tapes and tracks were listed and half a track here and and a, a scratch track there it was kind of disorganized so nick Virg de virgilio had to go through this entire mess of tapes with that and just a handwritten note that had the final what was believed to be the final track listing of this album uh, to go on and never strayed too far from from that in the creating of the album and because it's a rock opera, getting all these details and all the narratives correct was extremely important because this is a rock opera about a, a person named Johnny Virgil who went to L.A. with a little bit more than some talent and some convictions and some hopes and some dreams of making himself a big rock star. And 
Over the course of the album, that dream, though his convictions, are slowly dismantled by his experiences in the music business and pretty much whittles them down to a really kind of a low point. And it's all about this tension between an artist's desire to, to, to be faithful to their authenticity in light of the record industry's relentless pursuit to flatten it into something less than genuine, all in the name of, of making money. And there's many facets to Shame of the True that make it a, a, an amazing piece of work. Um, not the least of which is the fact that Kevin Gilbert was, from a certain perspective, a pop songwriter. So he was able to craft this album in a very, very uh, approachable way, and in a way where each of these songs are able to stand on their own and, and speak uh, a, a narrative that's self-encapsulated, but also fits together into a larger picture. And there's a couple tracks on here like um, The Ghetto of Beautiful Things and certifiable number one smash, which may not really necessarily be, you know, radio ready pop songs. Any rock opera that I can think of has a couple songs in there that are there to kind of push the narrative forward and may or may not stand on their own as individual songs. The, the Tommy has them, the wall has them, any great rock opera has these songs. And so those two songs kind of feel like they fill that role to a degree and they show a great diversity because, um, the, resentment and shame and anger that, that Kevin Gilbert felt about his situation as an artist struggling to survive in that situation really drove him to have a wide variety of phenomenally um, emotional performances on, on Shaving of the Truth. So that many of the songs are beautiful and touching and emotional and, you know, tear jerking. On the other side, you have songs that are almost crass um, and, and offending. And that wide range, uh, I think, assuredly reflects Kevin Gilbert's experiences uh, in the situation that he was in in L.A. trying to make it as an as a, as a artist with a very singular vision. And I said, baby, don't you ever use that word around me Cause I don't want to hear it anymore Now let's take a second to recognize uh, Nick Dervigilio's contributions to this album. Because, of course, the genius behind the album is, is entirely due to Kevin Gilbert. But Nick Dervigilio had a very uh, interesting situation with how he put this album together because he knew that it was unfinished at the time of Kevin Gilbert's death. He had to decide as he was going through it if there was space in, in the recordings because of lost material that maybe he hadn't found or because it was something intentional that, that Kevin Gilbert had, had not recorded yet. There's a section here where Nick Dervigilio uh, lifted a live performance, a vocal from a live performance, and put it in the middle of another song because it was the only thing he could find that fit that section. Now, musically speaking, because of the way that the Shaming of the True and Kevin Gilbert's music in general fits between progressive music and pop music, um, it's difficult to really pin down the style of music. I think that we can you can take a look at the drum playing on it and really hear some Phil Collins influenced stuff. And that's Nick DiVirgilio. He definitely has his foot, one foot in that, that style. Um, certainly, I think the bass playing sometimes takes on a real Chris, Chris Squire-esque feel. Um, but Chris Squire from the 80s, not like the more florid style that he had, but more like 90125 type playing where he's putting melodic chunks in between more rhythmic figures. But the beauty of Kevin Gilbert's work and throughout the, all the body of his work is the way that he's able to... Um, juggle complexity and accessibility. The album is harmonically rich and it's struck through with amazing melodic material and lushly arranged textures. Despite the fact that, you know, some of these are demo recordings that were, there were scratch recordings. Nick Virgilio did a really great job of filling it out and making it sound super pristine. But the complexity is there. And sometimes every now and then he puts it up in front, like in this Hi, example. John, it's Mel from Megalophone. I've been listening to your tape for the 19th time. Oh, that's another call. Can I call you back Hi, John, when I it's was guy in from a band? We used to sound, sound like, like this. And, the way you and I loved your songs. I really they think reminded it's great. me of myself. You sound like a Japanese war. In a good way. Here's my other number you for just a sec, that's another call to you. I'll get back to you. Have my girl take your information. His name is Johnny Virgil. I play this here guitar. Now, those of you that are listening might notice that sounds an awful lot like. 
And for sure, Kevin Gilbert knew who Gentle Giant was. At one point in time, he actually did a tribute track on a Gentle Giant, you know, covers album. So he definitely knew what he was doing as far as that goes. And I think it's a particular interest that another group that you can cite that um, that uses this sort of polyphonic uh, compositional approach to vocals is Spock's Beard. And Spock's Beard, which is, of course, Nick Virgilio's drummer, uh, was having their music mixed by Kevin Gilbert around the time this was being recorded for their second album, when those things started showing up. Now, is that because of something that you know Spock's Beard did with Kevin Gilbert or was just a mutual interest? I don't know, but it's an interesting connection between those two. And at the root of that connection, of course, is that Gentle Giant... Um, polyphony. But I think Suit Fuga is really, really textured both in terms of um, its execution and its meaning. Because in this song, you hear like the lone voice of, of Johnny Virgil sort of like trying to call out against this overwhelming chaos of people trying to vie for his attention and trying to hoodwink him into committing to their paradigm, and but ultimately, you know, with the subtext of selling him out in the end. And if you look back at that, each one of those lines carries its own narrative, and each one is brilliant in and of in its own way. And which brings me to the next point of the shaming of the true and Kevin Gilbert's music in general is the way in which I believe he is one of the most genius lyricists to come out of the late 20th century. So much of the shaming of the true is all about wordplay. I mean, look at the title, okay? It's a portmanteau of the taming of the shrew right? So there you've already got a situation where he's referring to something very classic, they sort of bastardizing for the sake of, of, the, of the story. But also, I mean, it makes sense, the term itself, the shaming of the true. Of course, him being the person that's true, that's trying to keep his integrity, and how he was shamed by his own eventual selling out to the man. For example, let's take a look at the climactic track on this album, A Long Day's Night. Now, by itself, unpack that, that title. You've got several things that that could possibly refer to. For example, The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night. Um, it could also refer to A Long Day's Work. It could also refer to A Day in the Life. You know, there's lots of ways that you could unpack that, the, the way that, that that song references both music and uh, Johnny Virgil's position in, in the narrative. And what I really love about this song is in the section in the middle, he really reveals his feelings about the whole situation in the series of two dreams. And they're kind of spoken word sections in the middle of the song. But particularly the, the, the dream that Johnny Virgil has in the second night, I think is very revealing. Three nights running now, I had the most unusual and disturbing dream. Where I'm a 19th century French painter with a palette and paintbrush and beret and an old big black suit. And I'm painting perfectly rectangular white lines on an endless snaking desert highway and people are yelling at me. You missed a spot. I mean, that's some heartbreaking stuff. And that's really coming, I think from the core of Kevin Gilbert's frustration about how he sees himself as an artist. And he's trying so hard, he's focusing so hard on trying to get his art to be seen by the masses and understood and accepted, um, and then constantly being criticized and having people looking over his shoulder. But in the end, Johnny Virgil kind of comes to some uh, some peace with the situation. And although I'm very much a fan of, of lyrics that can be multiply interpreted, I also have to really respect Kevin Gilbert's ability to avoid obvious language, but still create emotive, rich vocabulary, poetic vocabulary that's up ultimately is super relatable in the end of the at the end of the story. You know, I think, as you listen to the album, exactly what happens to Johnny Virgil. But there's so much wordplay that keeps it interesting and keeps you thinking about other references that he might be pulling on um, <clears throat> that enrich the storyline as you go. It's a phenomenal piece of work, and again, it's, it's a testament not only, of course, to Kevin Gilbert and his incredible genius, um, but also it's a really interesting snapshot of the mid 90s and the sort of the decadence of the mid 90s and the, the way that the music scene was working at that time and what it was like to be a musician that was struggling to find meaning and purpose and authenticity in light of those excesses. This is almost a museum piece of that setting. And as such, super important. And it's super important to, as far as Kevin Gilbert's swan song, it's like his big piece of music, which he never got to see released in his lifetime. I think it's broadly appealing, and I think it has something to say about what music was and is then and now.
But that's all I'm going to say about it for right now. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe and share it out with your friends. Also, follow me over on Spotify. I'll put um, the Kevin Gilbert track up over on Spotify list that I have. It's the big 2023 playlist for everything I've been listening to this year. Also, I've got a Patreon page. Please go check it out if you want to be involved in my top 20 of 2023. Um, I've got a viewer's bracket. And if you want to have your voice heard on that, I'd really appreciate your input on that particular project. So until I see you next time, I'll catch you on the flip side.